I came across the Black Girl Hockey Club, and I said, what? Wait a minute. Got to invite her in. Let me welcome the president of Black Girl Hockey Club, Miss Tanisha Singleton. Welcome to the Karen Hunter Show. Thank you for having me. All right. All right. Tanisha, where does a black girl, because I'm, I'm from East Orange, New Jersey. Yep. I, I went, I've, I've ice skated before. I hate being cold. <laughs> I cannot imagine ice skating with a stick and out there. Please mm-hmm. tell me where you grew up and then how you fell in love with, with hockey. You know, I grew up in Riverside, California. So yeah, the first time I laced up some ice skates, it was one of those like Roller City 2001 joints and like put on the skates. I was like, this hurt, you know? And I was like, I don't like this. Fell, bruised my tailbone. I haven't done it since. That's, you know, that's, that's real. But I'm a fan of sports. I'm a fan of athleticism. I'm a fan of culture and we can love and do everything. You know, so Black Girl Hockey Club, it started from from Renee Hess. She is our founder and executive director. And I discovered it around the end of 2019. I saw a tweet and they were doing a a meetup in LA Live when Las Vegas Golden Knights were in town to play the Kings. And I thought she was jiving. They were like, hey, we're going to do a meetup here. We're going to go see the Kings and the Golden Knights, Black Girl Hockey Club, everybody show up. And I was like, you trolling, you jive. There's no way this exists. I was like, there's, I, I, I was like, I'll play your reindeer games. Fine. So gave him some money, bought a ticket. I show up 10 a.m. outside of LA Live, downtown Los Angeles. And I saw over 50 people already, Black, White, Latin, Asian, young, old, grandbabies, grandparents, handicapped, blind, better. I, it was the most diverse collection of people that I had ever seen in my life, let alone at a park. But now you put that, you know, outside of a hockey game. I was like, this is amazing. And I was like, you know what? Where's this Renee person? I need to meet you. Met her. And I was like, listen, I just finished my doctorate. I was studying media psychology and studying specifically sports, culture, and society. I was like, I've got to work with you. I love this. This is what I'm talking about. And so since then, uh, she hasn't been able to get rid of me since. Became president on their board of directors and have been doing the most to help just amplify, bring awareness to this because, yeah, like you said, not a lot of Black people not even, not only play hockey, but we have to amplify ourselves, especially our women, to be able to say like, yes, we can do this. And you'd be surprised because I am, every single opportunity that I get to host uh, an event or give out a scholarship. And I see such young, beautiful black women doing what I can't, which is lace up them skates and check people with a stick. I was going to ask you, can, you care. I was wondering if you were actually out there on the ice oh, no. with the stick. Okay. All no, right, no, 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 no. I played basketball growing up and I was, you know, I'm a, I'm a sports fan, right? So pro wrestling, MMA, combat sports, football. I watch, I love and watch it all. Um, and this one, especially, but yeah, that's, that's not for me. I'm Speaking of MMA, I just saw Grant Hill. Shout out to Grant and Tamia. Love them immensely. Their daughter won her first MMA match, Myla. Uh, yeah, and uh, Grant posted on uh, right. Instagram. Yeah, he posted a little video of her choking. She she did a rear naked choke. Know, rear naked choke. RNC, the rear yeah. naked choke. Yeah, the young girl had to tap out. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> Grant and Tamia's baby. Look at her. <laughs> Doing it. Choking people. Choking, punching them in the face and choking them. I, I love so, it. <laughs> Dr. Singleton, I like I I know you I know that you actually have like a doctorate in this, right? So talk to me a little bit about about women and sports culture, particularly for girls. Like I I I can imagine like I see little girls at soccer games and how soccer is like completely become an American sport so much largely because of girls' soccer and be in in girls being more engaged in soccer. Talk a little bit about about sports culture for young girls and what should we be pushing our girls into sports and to do more in sports? Absolutely. Absolutely. For me, it, I recognized, and maybe it was because of the pandemic and everything that it just, everybody had time to reflect. You couldn't do damn else. Right. So I recognized though, maybe the reason I love sports and entertainment so much is because this is the only place I can go regularly to see someone who looks like me praised, celebrated, succeeded, right? Sports, it's our culture. How many times have we, have we you know, been saying like, 
I wish America loved black people the way they love black culture, right? Mm -hmm. And our women is a part of that. And right, like I have my PhD, that's about 22 years of school, right? K through 12, my undergrad, masters, all of that. And I realized in hindsight, after 22 years of education, I had three black teachers, three. I had Trisha Rose, Angela Davis, and my college prep teacher in high school. That's it. And that's wild to me. So I have my family, very, very big sports fans, the culture, it's in our lifestyle. It's what brought everybody together. I love experiences. I love building experiences. And the sport experience is one of those things that you can, there's so many different touch points. There's so many levels of affiliation and investment that's in that. Why not celebrate and empower and encourage women to be involved in that? Because we can do everything. We can. You just finished talking about Grant and Tamir's daughter, right? It's like, we could do that. And our, when we say like representation matters, I, that's across the board because it's not just like a diversity of like, okay, I'm checking boxes, but it's also a diversity of thought and perspective and skill. And if, and if you're just going to keep hiring an echo chamber and it's like, I grew up watching pro wrestling and stuff. And the only black female I remember as a kid was Sapphire who came out with Dusty Rhodes at the time and she, and they were dancing and stuff. Now cut two, we had two black women headlining WrestleMania for the first time with WWE, AEW is trying to do their thing. So pro wrestling, combat sports, soccer, MMA, hockey, we, we're here. We can do everything. And so it, it behooves us to empower our youth of all gender identities to be involved in sport because I learned so much from doing it. You get accountability, but it's not just even the athletic play, but it's also being a teammate. It's how to collaborate. It's how do you work with others? How do you talk with others? How do you check each other in a way where afterwards, like you could still be friends and because you're aligned on the same goal. That so much so of that is powerful. Today, yeah. we don't know how to talk to each other. Uh, we're here. Yeah with Dr. Tunisha Singleton. Where are you from originally? Uh, Riverside. California? Riverside. Mm -hmm. So growing up in Riverside, what inspired you to go get a PhD in psych sports psychology? What, what was that road? Yeah, it's in media psychology, my PhD, psychology. my background. It's in media marketing and communications. I had always wanted to be um, in entertainment in some way, shape or form. I think my first you know, kind of dream job was like, I wanted to be like that female Howard Stern and have like a white guy in the cage, like he had Robin and just like be able to talk about pop culture and all of that stuff. Um, and so I studied film, television and radio, but I'd recognized that the industry was changing. The world was changing. We were evolving. All of a sudden I couldn't watch sports without this phone in my hand. I was constantly live tweeting games. So I was like, yo, if this, if my fan experience is changing, I want to understand why. And so Doing that, I can only do it from the fundamentals of like the human experience. Psychology is so important. And so when I approached them and I was like, hey, has anybody in media psychology studied sports, culture, and fandom? And they're like, nope. And I was like, fine, here's my money. And I did that. And I graduated in 2017. So what's your what's your greatest sort of thesis around? What did you learn in all in all of that study? Give us like a, a headline or, or uh, of what came out of that psychological connection to sport and how it's changed. You know, if you start, if you go back, if you look at the evolution of sports media consumption, you can go back to uh, telegrams in the early, late 1800s into the first radio broadcast in like 1911 to the newspaper, to the Olympics finally getting in 36, to uh, color broadcasting to ESPN going 1979 and um, to go 24-7, all the way up into current day with over-the-top television, immersive technology, Twitter, and all of this stuff. All of that reveals that consumers want a more lean-in experience. We want to get closer to the game. We want to be able to multitask. We want to be able to build community and connection. And if you, how do you build commitment? How do you build community? There's three major things that you need to do. If you can get a fan to want to be a part of your team, feel like they need to be a part of your team and make them feel like they have some responsibility, like they should, you've got components of commitment. You've got somebody loyal. If you can make them want, need, and feel like they should cheer for you. And that goes, that transcends sports. That's how, yeah. that's loyalty. Yeah, you need to work on the DNC's campaign teams. <laughs> I, I am not opposed. I'm saying, but if that's how, that's if those are the emotional parts. It be we're all in the people business at the end of the day, so it behooves us to understand people, how we work, 
how we talk. They're going to have to think out of the box a little bit, Drew. I think that's a great idea. Tell us, um, Dr. Tanisha Singleton, about the Get Uncomfortable campaign. Yes. Get Uncomfortable campaign that Black Girl Hockey Club is is promoting. Tell us about it. Yes, we started this last fall, um, you know, in the wake of all the, you know, horrible stuff that had been going on, um, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, BLM, all of this from last fall. And we launched it because we wanted to really get loud and say, you know what, this isn't our, you can't, you can't rely on just black people to fix this problem. You can't. So it's going to take non POC to get uncomfortable. You can't force us to suffer from the problem and be responsible for fixing it as well. That's just not going to work. So the get uncomfortable campaign, we launched to disrupt racism on and off the ice in hockey. So in the first year we've made a pledge and we're have we have just almost 7,000 people who have taken our pledge. And we are in constant communication with them because we're saying, hey, there's a lot that we need to learn. Now, it's everyone's doing these DEI trainings, diversity, equity, inclusion, all of this stuff. But it's okay to not know. What's not okay is that choice to stay ignorant. And so we're helping people find out how to do the homework. Our three pillars are encourage, uh, employ, and educate. And so now that we finished our first year, our second year, we're, for, we're focusing on the workplace. So how do we get uncomfortable in the workplace? And hockey right now, it ain't cute. It's not a good time to be a hockey fan right now because there are a lot of victim shaming and blaming and racism that's been going on. It has a history of being toxic. We know this. But Black Girl Hockey Club, we, didn't, we, we weren't going to wait for anybody to serve us. Renee started this three years ago because we are here to serve ourselves and make a community for ourselves. And so with our Get Uncomfortable campaign, we're having, we're, ple- we're hoping people take this pledge, start in constant communication with us and showcase that, yes, they will not tolerate this anymore. Because the only way that we can change and, and continually move forward with this is if we have non-POCs involved as well, because you can't leave it all up to us. It's about controlling what you can control. So do that self-audit, do that work. It's uncomfortable. That's why we called it that. Because it's not easy. And so people need to follow you on Twitter at Black Girl Hockey. And they can follow you directly at T Singleton Says. Uh, but where do they go to get uncomfortable? Where should they go? Yes, go blackgirlhockeyclub.org. And you can take our Get Uncomfortable pledge right there on the top page. We have a button that says take the pledge. Do it right there. We will get in touch with you and stay in constant communication because we are regularly putting on digital events. Um, and we're getting back outside in real life too soon um, and hitting Hard some. Enough. Yeah, we're going to be hitting some games soon in LA, Seattle, um, hopefully going to Toronto as well. So we're excited.